This episode of The Anxious Truth is brought to you by me, because I'm not just a podcaster, I'm also an author. I've written several useful books on anxiety and anxiety recovery, and I know you're going to find them helpful. You can find them on my website at theanxioustruth.com. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is episode number 181. Welcome back to the program. Welcome back to the show. This episode is entitled, What are coping skills and do we want them? Which I know probably sounds kind of weird because, of course, we want coping skills. Everybody wants coping skills, right? I get it. But, and this might be largely a semantic argument, one word versus the other, but let's really get into what coping skills are and let's find out if we really do want them or not. So first of all, I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of The Anxious Truth. And if this is your first time here, welcome. I am glad that you are here. This is the podcast where we talk about all things anxiety, anxiety disorders, and recovery related. If you have been here before and you are back to listen to another episode, welcome back. I'm very appreciative of your time and attention. So let's talk about coping skills. This is a phrase we hear all the time in mental health circles, especially when it comes to anxiety, like coping skills, coping skills, coping skills, everybody wants to teach you coping skills. What are coping skills? And do we actually want to use them? Which is the question of the day. So here's the way I see it. Coping skills, and again, this might be semantics, but sometimes the semantics matter. So stick with me on this. Coping skills, traditionally, in what I see, are skills, techniques, tips, tricks, rituals that people will often try to teach you. Sometimes therapists and counselors and doctors will teach you or try to give you that are designed to be used in periods of anxiety related distress, discomfort and fear. So when you are afraid because you are having a panic attack or you're in the middle of an anxiety wave or in some way you are feeling fear or discomfort based on anxiety anxious thoughts sensations ideas then many people will try to give you coping skills or will try to teach you coping skills that you can use in those moments what are those coping skills designed to do well in many instances they are designed to do things like make an end some people will flat out tell you Here's three things you could do to stop a panic attack. I don't think anybody would argue that that falls under the realm of coping skills, right? Here's five ways to stop a panic attack. Here's four things you can do to prevent a panic attack. Here's three things you can do during a panic attack. So admittedly, I'm speaking quite specifically here to the panic disorder crowd, people who are dealing with panic disorder and are experiencing recurring panic attacks and are afraid of them. But in the coping skills sort of universe, you see that stuff all the time. So the coping skills that you are being given or people are trying to teach you are very often designed to try to make it stop or go away. Here are ways that you can ground yourself. Here are things. So here, here the coping skills that we most commonly hear involve special ways to somehow ground yourself, things to repeat to yourself. I am safe. I am safe. I got this. I'm okay. I am strong. This too shall pass. Uh, count four blue things. Tell me all the things you can smell. We all know the usual coping skills. Get ice and hold it in your hand or pop a strong mint in your mouth or take a glass of cold water or splash water on your face or snap a rubber band. Literally, somebody sent me a Dr. Oz reel the other day where Dr. Oz, the famous TV doctor, says, here's how a rubber band can, can cure your anxiety. And I, my head almost exploded. But OK, we all know the usual coping skills, right? Now, let me address something pretty quickly here. That grounding thing, name four blue things, tell me all the things you can see, tell me four things you can smell, has a place that is not completely hoo-hoo. And they are often used in situations where people are really having a hard time emotionally regulating and sometimes begin to lose touch with, don't be afraid of this, but are having a hard time staying in touch with the here and now in reality, right? So often those tools are used in those extreme circumstances and they are useful. So I am not completely dismissing the grounding exercises. I understand the context in which they are most useful, but they are also often handed out for people who are dealing with 
and generalized anxiety, anxiety spikes, or panic attacks as coping skills. So most of the, the coping skills in the traditional sense that you're going to be taught or given in the online mental health community are generally designed, or at least you're told that they should probably make this anxiety less, make it go away altogether, prevent it from happening, short circuit it, or otherwise talk yourself out of it. Those are the, the most usual coping type skills. Okay. Is that a bad thing? First thing I want to say is anybody who's trying to teach you coping skills in that sense, in the more traditional sense, to help you through periods of distress or discomfort or fear, I don't believe that any of those people have any malicious intent. They're not trying to give you bad information. They are trying to help you. And that probably comes from a place of compassion and caring. I absolutely will acknowledge that. I don't think anybody does that just because they feel like it. They genuinely want to help you. However, is coping that way what we want to do? If we are trying to learn that we do not have to fear our own bodies, anxious sensations, anxiety symptoms, we don't have to fear our own mind, anxious and fearful thoughts or intrusive or recurring thoughts, then do we need to find ways to handle, deal or cope with them? Questionable from where I sit. I don't know if approaching this as a coping problem is necessarily a good way to frame it. So if we are primarily concerned with finding coping skills that are designed to make it stop, lessen it, or somehow talk us out of it so that we can extract ourselves from that discomfort and fear as quickly and painlessly as possible, then we are essentially saying that, yeah, this is a thing that must be stopped, should try, could be prevented if we can do it. And if you do get into the thick of that, we can try and get you out of it as quick as we can. But really and truly, if we're trying to learn that what you're going through is just a misdirected threat response, then do we want the message that we need to extract ourselves from this as quickly as possible? And here are 17 different tricks you can use to do that. So coping skills generally designed to get you out of that fearful, distressed situation, which I totally get. I want you out of that distressed, fearful situation too. I would prefer if you learn experientially that you can handle it. You don't have to make it stop really quickly. You're capable of processing your way through that and navigating it through to its natural end. And therefore, you will be less afraid of it the next time and the next time and the next time. So I want you out of that uncomfortable, distressed, fearful situation too. But I would like that to be a little bit more lasting and durable and have larger implications in your life other than when I panic, I must do these rituals to get me through it. So what are coping skills? Well, we went through them. What are they designed to do? Generally speaking, coping skills that I, I we usually in a traditional sense in the mental health community are designed to extract you from that situation or get you out of it in as quick and as painless a way as possible or to make it go away or to make it feel less scary. But in reality, what are we learning if we think that we must use these rituals to cope or handle or somehow get us through this episode again? So the quest, second question, what are coping skills and do we want them? Well, do we want coping skills? I can tell you that in my own recovery, coping skills were not helping me at all. Not at all. And I did have a therapist for a short amount of time. And you guys know that I'm constantly beating the drum of finding a therapist that specializes in anxiety disorders. I love my therapist. She is awesome. I'm sure, she still is. Uh, but she was not an anxiety specialist. She was not. She was very helpful to me, but I knew that going in that she wasn't a specialist. She was kind of into the coping stuff, but we had such a great relationship and she was so understanding, so caring and listened so closely to me that we quickly like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing the count the blue things thing. I got to have a better way. And she was so open to that. So interestingly, my therapist personally started to go down the traditional coping skills route, saw that I did not want to do that because I didn't think it was going to have any lasting benefit for me. I tried all of those things already. And she she was list she listened and she said, Okay, how do you want to do it? And I told her what I was doing. And she was so supportive of me. So in the end, like the people who are trying to teach you coping skills are trying to help. But is that really helping you? So if you have been dealing with panic disorder or agoraphobia or OCD or whatever the particular situation is for a protracted amount of time, 
and you have been continually trying to use traditional coping skills, and all you're really managing to do is sort of, you know, crawl your way out of one episode after another, then it, it probably is worth thinking about this. Do we really want coping skills? Is it really doing anything for you in the end? So I would assert that coping skills in the traditional sense, oh, I could just, I'm hearing the comments in my head now. I know this is not gonna go over well, but I'm hoping that you're getting what I'm trying to tell you. In the traditional sense, all those coping skills are could be more counterproductive than helpful in the long term. So what would we want instead of those things? Because we don't want things that reinforce the idea that we must escape from our anxiety and our discomfort. You need special rituals to get you through being afraid. And without those rituals, what would happen? What would happen if you didn't do your coping skills? You'll explode, you'll die. Are your coping skills somehow saving you from the fate that you are worried about? Like we run the risk of saying that, oh, the only reason why I make it through my panic attacks is because of my rubber band, which is not true. Like it's not true in any way, whether you had a rubber band or not, whether you count blue things or not, that panic attack will always end. You might not believe me and you might wanna argue that, nope, if I don't count blue things, my panic attack will last forever. That is patently not true. So in the end, do we want things that teach us that we must do this to make it end or to get through it? Or do we actually want to say, no, 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 I, I can let it start, re reach its natural peak without resistance and then dissipate. Because as anybody who has done that will tell you, the first few times you do that, you don't snap the rubber band, you don't pop the mints, you don't call your safe person, you don't run home, you don't start repeating mantras obsessively and compulsively. When you don't do that and you come through the other side of that fear and it starts to naturally come back down on the other side, it is a charge like you would not believe. It's such a good feeling. So the number of people every day that I get to hear say, oh my God, I did it and it feels amazing. There, That's what we're looking for right there. That's what we're looking for. When they actually drop the traditional coping skills and say, I'm just gonna let this come and, and hit me full force because I need to learn that even when I do, I am capable of moving through this and coming out the other side, afraid, shaken, feeling not so great, but still okay. And then the next time I'll be a little less shaken and a little less afraid. Like that's what we're after. And none of that necessarily involves coping skills. So we hear words like willfully tolerate the anxiety and the panic, accept it, float through it. I use the term surrender all the time. Like surrender is a pretty brutal term, but I like it because it's super descriptive. It's accurate. Like instead of saying I must use all my coping skills to get through my next panic attack or my next anxiety wave, if instead I say, well, I'm just going to surrender to it, I'm going to let it do whatever it wants to do. Well, then it will do whatever it wants to do, which is to naturally rise, peak and fall when we don't add to it. That's what it does. That is the natural function of the anxiety cycle. It rises, it hits its peak, and then it comes back down again. As long as I don't send more danger signals that will make it rise again, as long as I can show my fear center, my lizard brain, my amygdala, that the danger has passed, or better, better, the repeated experience is that there isn't really any danger, the better that's gonna end up for me. Those attacks or episodes become shorter, uh, lesser duration, farther between. That would, that's that's what starts to happen over time. If instead I send the signal that I must run for my rubber band or my cold water or my mints or my my essential oils to sniff, or I must call my mom or I must be with my husband or whatever it happens to be. If I send those signals all the time, then essentially I'm saying, well, the only way I could possibly get through this is if I call my safe person or if I go home or if I stop the car and, and put the lavender oil under my nose, whatever it happens to be. So if you use your usual coping skills, I, I have to count the blue things or I'm not gonna get through this, you haven't learned that lesson. You haven't experienced the peak and you you still think that somehow you must do that or it will do some sort of damage or you'll, you won't get out of it, but then you're just afraid of the next one. Like, okay, I guess I just have to wait for the next attack and all I know is that it'll come and I'll just use my lavender oil or my rubber band or whatever my mantra is to just get me through it again. So. Coping skills generally designed to extract you from the anxiety and make it stop or lessen it. And I think the lesson there is that you must take special evasive action in the face of anxiety and panic and discomfort. But do we want that? 
I would say the answer is no. So I know it's sounding like I, I'm not trying to do a whole nother podcast episode dumping on lavender oil and your favorite, you know, like whatever crystals. I mean, if you like those things, there's nothing wrong with that. But think about coping skills. What do they represent? What are they teaching you? What do they say? And do is that what you want? Is that actually what we want for long lasting, durable recovery? Now, don't get me wrong. On a minute by minute, day to day, hour to hour basis, you may find coping way more attractive than surrendering, floating through and willfully tolerating anxiety and panic. That's true. In the moment, in the moment, that lavender oil or that mint, that cold water calling your mom and feeling like somebody is saving you does feel better. I am not in any way going to deny that you do get more immediate relief when you try to use those traditional coping air quotes coping skills. It's harder to not use them. But the lesson is more valuable and leads to more productive recovery. So there you go. What are coping skills? And do we want them? Well, I think we know what they are now. And I think the answer is do we really want them? Well, in the moment we do. But really, on the long term, we kind of don't. We kind of don't. We want to be careful about how we use them. We want to be careful about using coping skills as crutches or necessities or rituals that you think save you every time. They do not because you have never needed saving. And you can do this even without those traditional coping skills. So there you go. There is our coping skills episode. I've been meaning to do this one for a little while. Hopefully, it has been helpful. If you have questions or comments, always want to hear them. I have a feeling this one is going to spark a lot of discussion. I am ready for it, so bring it. But uh, I'm kidding. The discussion is always really good. I so appreciate this community. I cannot even begin to tell you because 99.5%, 99.9% of the time, the discussion is fruitful. It's supportive. It's mature. It's it's caring and compassionate. You guys help each other out, and we, we share ideas, and we move forward together, and I love that. So bring what you got. I am happy to hear it. I am going to play you out of this episode with Afterglow by my friend Ben Drake. As always, you can find Ben on his website at bendrakemusic.com. Tell him I said hi. If you're watching on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, like the video. If you're listening to the episode on iTunes or Spotify, leave us a five-star rating and take a minute to write a review. If you don't know anything about my books and all that stuff, go to theanxioustruth.com, check it out. And thank you, as always, for coming by and giving me your time and attention. I hope this has been helpful. I will see you next week. And remember... This is the way. This is where your story begins. You got the feeling that you're gonna win. Yeah, you're doing fine. Now in the city and you're living fast. No looking back or dwelling on the past. You know you'll never get another chance to go and live your life.